Uh, hello, everyone. Um, we are one week into September, officially today, one week into National Recovery Month, and there are more than 22 million individuals in the U.S. in recovery. Our loved ones, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers, 22 million stories of hope. Good afternoon and welcome to Changing the Narrative, How the Media Can Help America Recover. My name is Kirsten Sudo Seckler, and I'm the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Shatterproof, a national nonprofit where we believe that no one should struggle or die from substance use disorder, a treatable chronic illness. At Shatterproof, we guide individuals and families through the complexities of substance use disorder. We inform the public about prevention, treatment, and recovery of addiction. And we mobilize communities to take action and end addiction stigma. Why don't we learn more? We're going to watch a video real quick. America's opioid crisis shows no signs of abating. Tonight, a grim statistic. One American is dying from a drug overdose every five minutes. Where the opioid epidemic has now evolved into a fentanyl nightmare. There are millions of these dangerous fake pills out there, and they are killing thousands of Americans. We have a vision that our society will look this disease straight in the eye, prevent it and treat it with love and empathy and with protocols based on science. We are coming together to increase awareness and funding for the prevention, treatment, and recovery of this disease. Good we are here for friends. We are here for family. We are here for community. And we are here to bring the disease of addiction out of the darkness and into the light. We are shatterproof. son Brian struggled with addiction for eight years and during that time he went to eight different treatment programs. Shatterproof is currently developing public databases in multiple states that if successful will allow the public to identify, evaluate, and compare substance use treatment programs. I would like to extend my appreciation to President Bill Clinton, Chelsea Clinton, and their Health Matters initiative. I'm very grateful to be here today at a critical time talk about why we must tackle this issue and what Congress must do to tackle this issue. We need to start treating people in this country, not jailing them. We need to give them the tools they need to recover because every life is precious. Every life is an individual gift from God. And we have to stop judging and start giving them the tools they need to get better. I don't think about this issue as a public official or as a healthcare guy. I think about it as a father. I've talked to people who've been in the middle of this, and they're among the grittiest and gutsiest people I've ever met. And they deserve our respect and our love and our support. Let's create that world that Brian didn't see. Let's create that world for the next young man that comes along, the next young woman that comes along, the next family. Let's drag addiction out of the shadows and into our hearts. I can't imagine a more perfect expression of humanity. Thank you. So we like to say that the proof in Shatterproof is that we are grounded in science and evidence. Everything we do, we share, is based on that science. 
And that is why we have brought together the top scientists and experts to share important information to help the media in their reporting. You heard the headlines in the video. They've been negative. Well, we want to change that. So I want to thank Indivier for making today possible. And I want to welcome Dr. Nora Volkov, Dr. Christian Heidbreder, Dr. Tom McClellan, and Alessandria Sosas, who are living, who's, she is living proof that recovery is possible. And I cannot wait to hear more about her story. I also want to acknowledge some people in the room. Kevin Roy, who's the Chief Policy Officer at Shatterproof. Courtney McKeon, who leads our National Stigma, um, our National Stigma Initiative at Shatterproof. And Kristen Pendergrass, who's on our policy team as well. Everyone here today recognizes how the media plays a critical role in shaping public perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors. Substance use disorder and addiction are constantly in the headlines. And the purpose of this event is to discuss substance use disorder and the science behind recovery options, as well as foster conversations between stakeholders, experts, and recovery patients in the addiction space to bring awareness and treatment options that are currently available and provide an up-to-date, fact-checked, and evidence-based information for meaningful reporting. This event is intentionally <coughs> being held during Recovery Month. Since 1989, Recovery Month has been held every September to promote and support new treatment and recovery practices, the nation's strong and proud recovery community, and dedication of service providers and communities who make recovery and all its forms possible. So our goal is to shift the narrative to a narrative of recovery. As I mentioned, there are 22 million people in recovery. But it is also important to know that there are 46 million people ages 12 years old and older who are struggling with substance use disorder right now. Those are 46 million people whose lives can be saved by you, reporters and journalists. Saved because in a future story, you can provide trusted resources and tools for your audience. Saved because you shared a story of recovery. Saved because you used language, less stigmatizing language and imagery. Saved because you educated and the audience about quality addiction treatment. Saved because you shared that recovery is possible. Saved because you shared hope. Over 30 years ago, when the stigma was highest with HIV and AIDS, there was a press conference where Magic Johnson shared his HIV diagnosis. That moment was a tipping point to change the narrative around that illness. While Magic Johnson receives so much credit for telling his story and sharing it so openly, we have to remember that the reporters who came to that press conference, the reporters that wrote the stories, really were heroes as well. They helped change the narrative. It was like an AP reporter like John Nagel, who reported the story and helped the world hear that. So today, you'll receive the information, the tools that will help change that narrative, and the power to save a life. I hope that one of you will be the next John Nagel. So thank you again for being here. This is going to be a great session. Uh, we're going to hear from each of our panelists individually. And then we're going to follow up with a discussion and some questions from all of you. So please hold your questions to the end. And for those of you joining virtually, all you have to do is press the window underneath the uh, player, and you can sh ask any questions along the way. All right. So to kick us off, I want to introduce Dr. Noah Volkov. Doc Dr. Volkov is the director of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, otherwise known as NIDA. NIDA is the world's largest funder of scientific research on the health aspects of drug use and addiction. Dr. Volkov's work has been instrumental in demonstrating that drug addiction is a brain disorder. As a research psychiatrist, Dr. Volkov pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate how substance use affects brain functions. In particular, her studies have documented how changes in dopamine system affect and the functions of brain regions involved with reward and self-control and addiction. She has also made important contributions to the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, and aging. So thank you for joining us, and I will turn it over to you.
But first of all, it is uh, wonderful to be here. It's uh, actually a great opportunity. I completely agree, absolutely. You are the ones that can shape a culture, that can modify the way that we do look at things. And so you do have an enormous amount of responsibility. Um, I come from the science, I'm a physician, and we, um, as director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, actually, uh, my, my responsibility is to advance the science in ways that help us understand why is it that drugs produce what they do, addiction, who is more or less vulnerable, and how do we take that information in order to do treatment prevention and certainly help guide on policies. Uh, that's my responsibility, and, I, and we can, and we have actually built an enormous amount of science as it relates to understanding why uh, drugs do what they do, and why certain people are more vulnerable, and why is it so difficult for someone to stop taking drugs when they are addicted, and how what treatments work, and how to prevent addiction, and yet what has happened is that despite all of these discoveries and knowledge we have basically continued as a society to stigmatize the drug user, addiction, and the systems that take care of them. And so that's why these dialogues become so very important. So uh, if I um, basically start with something that, that will give you an insight as I think about it, because uh, by the way, I, I've been involved in drugs and addiction since was a medical student. I'm obsessed about it. That's really literally what what I think most of the time. And so, because it's a big, it has been actually a big enigma in my brain. And I do have, like many other people, history of family of addiction. And it has always been so extraordinarily difficult for me to understand how is it that someone can actually forego everything that is supposed to be important biologically for survival and socially for well being in order to take a drug. Can that drug really do something so extraordinary that you say, yes, it's worth it? And particularly when you know that if you ask people that are addicted to the drug, why do you take it? Most of them will say, really, I really don't even know why. I just cannot control it. The drug is not even pleasurable. What drugs do, all of the ones that have the ability to produce addiction, is actually they activate in ways that are supra-physiological, more powerful than food, if sort of, unless you're extremely, extremely hungry, um, the system that motivates your actions. And so if you think about it, and I think what is the metaphor that's good for the uh, dopaminergic system? It's the system that energizes our actions. So I would say it's the gas that you need in a car, which without it, you will basically not have the energy to drive your car. Well, the dopaminergic system does that. It actually drives your action and makes you take decisions about what is more relevant than others. And when you start to think about it, you come to realize why drugs can be so powerful. Because they are so intense that they overtake other stimuli, and they basically, by doing that, they become the main energizing reinforcer that drives your activities. Being such an important one, that slide there, what you see, the system that, imagine, is, I, I love the French had this word that says, la joie de vivre, the joy of life, the joy of excitement, what motivates us all in everyday life. That is extremely important across all of the brain. It's not just one area that is affected or other. And so what research has shown is that with repeated administration of drugs on people that become addicted, this has very negative consequences in terms of how it affects your ability to self-regulate in the, in the ways that you feel emotions. You become much more enhanced to, to stressors and to negative emotional states on the way that you perceive reward, on the drive that you have towards it. So drugs ultimately affect the brain in a very widespread way. Now, why is this important as it relates, of course, to understand addiction, but ultimately to understand treatment and recovery and prevention? You know, one of the aspects that it has become so very clear is the brain is extraordinarily neuroplastic. And what it means, it is changed by the environment you are exposed to. Those changes occur more rapidly when you are a young person, which is why people that, when they start taking drugs early on, are at higher risk. But that neuroplasticity persists. So if someone takes the drug, that drug is physically changing their brain in ways that actually enhance the value of that drug. But at the same time, it is being degraded by the behavioral consequences that that drug taking has on an individual. 
And you say, well, what do you mean? And I mean, for example, the social isolation, the discrimination, the hopelessness, the helplessness, all of that leads the person to isolate themselves more and more. And that makes them more vulnerable. And then that becomes a major, actually, uh, risk in order to, to achieve recovery. Uh, we also know, too, I mean, another aspect about addiction, yes, we can identify what brain changes happen in the people that are addicted. But we also know that it's not just about drugs. And when, when we bring up the notion of addiction as a disease of the brain, people complain because they say, well, there are many social factors that are responsible for it. And the reality is that these not are not exclusionary uh, 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 concepts. You can have a disease that is influenced by genes, but it's also influenced by your environment. In fact, I would say that most of the diseases that we know of are like that. And in some instances, more genes than environment, but for all of them, genes and environment interaction. For the mental disorders, and in particularly for substance use disorder, this is particularly true. And it's very important because right now we do not know how to modify genes. So if I have a gene that makes me vulnerable, that's not something that allows me to prevent or treat per se directly as a gene. But what genes are doing is modifying the way that you respond to the environment. And it is that environment that you can modify, both for prevention, for treatment, and recovery. So what is it that is important in the environment? We know that the social determinants of health, which are the social determinants also for addiction, are crucial. And this determines why certain individuals are at much higher risk of taking drugs and becoming addicted, including those that are physically abused, sexually abused, those that have been in neglect, those that come from very impoverished environments, those that have been discriminated, those whose parents have been put in prisons or jail. Many of the reactions of our society or what happens to a person to take drugs are making their children much more vulnerable. But those are actionable issues because we know how to manipulate the environment, even if we don't know how to actually manipulate the genes. And those environmental factors are also crucial for recovery. So what is the first? I want to actually utmost as we're struggling the most severe uh, epidemic of drugs in our country with the overdose crisis. We need to tackle the fact that if we do not prioritize prevention, protecting people to go through the field of drug taking and addiction, we're always going to constantly fight it. So prevention is something that is under underutilized in our country. There's actually not even an infrastructure in the United States to provide prevention. We have healthcare systems that provide medical care and treatment, but not prevention. And yet prevention is likely to be the most consequential. There's a significant amount of evidence of interventions that work, whether they are at the individual or at the universal level, that engage multiple partners. There's a multiplicity. They are not being utilized. This has not become a priority for many reasons, including the lack of sustainable resources to advance it. But we can pre prevent addiction, and it's actually one of the things that hurts me the most. Every single death from overdoses or drugs is preventable. And I cannot say that necessarily all the way with cancer. So these are the numbers that we're facing right now with the overdose crisis. And it was mentioned before, one person is dying every five minutes. And if you go to different communities, I mean, how this is reflected. I was just in, in an Indian reservation, and I was speaking where someone stood up, and I said, we are burying on a weekly basis a young person. So the devastation is, I, I don't think that we've ever seen anything like that. And we've seen it, and we've seen the devastation that COVID um, brought, and yet we reacted as a whole in a society. We have not done that for the overdose crisis. And I think that in terms of numbers, we do have many tools to apply them. So those are the numbers, and I don't see the ones, but the next one is the treatments. We have treatments that work. Actually, medications for opioid use disorder, whether it is methadone, whether it's buprenorphine, whether it's naltrexone, if you basically have a person that's addicted to opioids on these medications and you sustain them on the correct dose, and keep them um, compliant with their treatment, you can prevent overdose mortality from 70 to 95%. They work. 
but we're not implementing them. And basically, the estimates indicate that basically around 20% of people that could benefit from an opioid use disorder get them. But of those 20% that get them and 80% that don't, and that's why we continue to see that increased rise in mortality, at least 50 to 40% of them stop taking them within six months. So we do not provide a support system that keeps the persons in treatment, which is actually crucial and fundamental for the treatment of any other disease. So among the priorities that we've been actually doing at the National Institute on Drug Abuse is how do we create models of care that can penetrate to provide with treatment in situations where people that their drugs will end up with. So healthcare is one of them, justice settings, communities. So we basically, through research and science, develop models of care that actually show that their, their effectiveness, not just their effect, efficacy, their effectiveness and their sustainability, including initiating treatments of people that are in jail or prisons that have an opioid use disorder, significantly improving their likelihood of not dying from overdoses and not being reincarcerated. But we're not using them. As I say, 20%, 80% are not receiving treatment. Why is that so? And I think that this is at the essence of where you all can make a, a huge difference. I started by saying, we stigmatize the drug user, we stigmatize addiction, we stigmatize the systems of care that take care of people, we stigmatize the medications that we're using for opioid use disorder. And this is not justified by the science. And what I can tell you in terms of if someone is stigmatized, if someone is discriminated, they're not going to go seek care, help or care. They are going to be less likely to stay in treatment. And if they are in treatment and the, the disease that they are suffering is stigmatized and they discriminated, much less likely to achieve recovery. And as a society, we will continue to actually bear the cost of the tragedy of the, all of those lives lost and the consequences to their families, but also importantly, the enormous economic burden that it constitutes. So addressing stigma and getting rid of it so that as a society, we open up about the need to provide the resources and the quality of care that people need, uh, both for their treatment and their prevention, is actually something that is crucial for addressing the overdose crisis. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much. All right, now we're gonna, um, this is for Dr. Christian Heibreiter, who's going to join us now. He combines 30 years of leadership experience in the neurosciences, spanning the academic, governmental, and industry, industrial sectors across Europe and the United States. During his career, Dr. Haybreder has published more than 350 peer-reviewed scientific publications, reviews, book chapters, and published conference proceedings. Dr. Haybreder has begun his career as a researcher at the University of Louvain in Belgium, at the National Institute of Drug Abuse at Princeton University, and at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He has subsequently held positions at SmithKline Beecham Neuroscience Department, GSK's R&D Center, and Excellence for Drug Discovery, and Altria's Client Services Health Sciences Department. He is appointed Global R&D Director at RBP, now in Divier, in 2009, and a remit to lead global strategies to drive the overall development of new pharmaceutical pharmacotherapies in the area of addiction and related to comorbidities. He holds an, MA, an, MA, an BA, an MA, and PhD degrees from the University of Louvain and Certificate of Strategy Innovation from the Wharton School of Business. He is affiliate professor of the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology at the Virginia Commonwealth University of Medicine. I welcome him to the stage so that he can share more about his expertise and treat. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, today. So uh, let me start this presentation with uh, perhaps a few uh, commonalities between uh, people who are actually suffering from substance use disorder in uh, general. 
what you see is that typically uh, these are people who initiated drug treatment fairly early on uh, in uh, life. They um, have been misusing uh, or abusing multiple drugs. And this is a very important message that I will reiterate during this presentation because we see more and more what we should call polysubstance use disorder. And clearly, when you are working in addiction medicine, uh, the temptation is to focus very much on uh, different um, uh, substance uh, use disorders, such as opioid use disorder, alcohol use disorder, cannabis use disorder, stimulant use disorder, and so on. But the reality is becoming significantly more complex. And it is really a polysubstance use disorder um, a challenge that we currently have. They typically have a family history of substance use uh, disorder. Uh, they, they are suffering from family uh, dysfunction, uh, child abuse, uh, neglect. Very often they have already been hospitalized uh, because of their substance use disorder. But this is complicated because they may visit uh, hospitals for a comorbid or co-occurring uh, disease, so the diagnosis is sometimes very complex uh, to, uh, to make. Um, unfortunately, very often in their journey through substance use, uh, they um, were involved with the criminal justice uh, system, and I will come back to that a little bit later. Um, they, 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 they typically um, also are, are suffering from co-occurring uh, or comorbid uh, uh, mental health. And I really insist on this uh, because um, we are dealing with people who are suffering not only from a use disorder, but from a constellation of uh, mental uh, illnesses. And I would like to illustrate this point with a very uh, uh, intriguing data uh, that have been released by SAMHSA in their report last year, and these are data for uh, uh, 2021, looking actually at the prevalence of uh, substance use depending on your past year uh, mental illness, uh, either any mental illness or serious mental illness. And you can see that across the board, actually being uh, opioids, uh, cannabis, uh, 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 stimulants, uh, alcohol, especially binge uh, alcohol, and very importantly as well, nicotine, including nicotine vaping, you can see that the prevalence of substance use is significantly higher if you were suffering from uh, any mental illness or serious mental uh, illness. And again, I will come back to that a little bit later because it is really, really critical to understand that this is a core part of the disease. So that's a kind of situation analysis. Let's look at a contemplating um, uh, treatment. And typically, uh, people with a substance use disorder will start contemplating a treatment because they are willing to change. They reached an inflection point where, in fact, a change is uh, uh, required because they reached the bottom, so to speak. And there might be different reasons for, for that. It might be health-related. Uh, uh, they uh, may have been um, uh, dealing with uh, parenting or custody uh, issues. Um, but uh, they may also have um, some pressure from the criminal justice uh, system. And there are two points I would like to make uh, here. First, please understand that change has nothing to do with a linear process. It's the antithesis of being linear, actually. If anything, it's pretty chaotic. Um, and, and, and there is no such a thing as immediate uh, transformation uh, or abrupt transformation. This is not the way uh, recovery is actually, uh, actually working. And I think that this has major consequences in the way we are looking at best practices in addiction medicine, because I think it is time to really reconsider how we define change. Um, and so uh, I think that recovery, and I will again elaborate a little bit more on this later on in this presentation, recovery uh, is not only about abstinence, 
Um, abstinence is an important part, but it's all about long-term uh, behavioral modifications. It is uh, about long-term improvements. It's a multifactorial process, including improvement in physical health, mental health, quality of uh, life, uh, employment, uh, healthcare resource uh, utilization. This is very important also in the way we are trying to uh, con not only conceptualize, but actually measure what recovery is, is all about. Now, you contemplate treatment. The next step is to actually engage in treatment and uh, 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 very importantly, uh, staying in treatment. And there, of course, there are a lot of uh, barriers uh, still. Um, as Nora explained, there are uh, you know, very high levels of stigma in uh, this uh, disease. Not only stigma associated with the disease per se, but even stigma associated with using medications in order to try to uh, get uh, better. There is a, a pretty significant complexity of the substance use disorder care uh, system and navigating through that system when you suffer from a substance use disorder is very, very uh, challenging. We were discussing before this presentation about some people who are homeless and suffer from a substance use disorder. So how do you do that uh, is, is you know, extremely uh, challenging. There are some payor policies, such as prior authorization, for example, that are additional barriers. I also want to think of all those patients who are in uh, remote parts of the country. Uh, we know patients who, for example, have to drive 300 miles in order to find um, a relevant provider. So again, this is not you know, very um, uh, conducive to uh, actually uh, not only seek treatment, but stay in uh, treatment. Um, the, 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 the list here is long. Uh, one thing, again, I would like to uh, point out uh, is this issue of mental health. Uh, and again, just for, for context uh, here, same report from uh, SAMHSA back uh, last, uh, last year, about 19.4 million people actually had a substance use disorder and any uh, mental health. Um, and, and that number goes to 6.4 million with a substance use disorder and a serious mental uh, illness. So again, we need to keep that in mind. When we study substance use disorder, um, we need to look at the use disorder, but at the more holistic uh, uh, perspective of, of all the comorbidities um, that, that are affecting these uh, people. So, um, when we, you have challenges, there are solutions. So let, let me elaborate a little bit on potential things that can be done. And, and here I would like to actually refer to uh, a concept that was published a few years ago by um, colleagues at uh, Columbia University. And they introduced the concept of a uh, cascade of care. And I think that this is very important when you consider the journey to recovery because it's not um, uh, only recovery. It is uh, what can we do at the level of uh, prevention, diagnosis, engagement in care, treatment initiation, and then very importantly, staying in treatment, leading ultimately to uh, recovery. So a few ideas about uh, prevention. Uh, there are some really uh, good examples of uh, school-based programs, for example, in public messaging and health education. And, and Nora mentioned, for example, the, the HEAL initiative and the uh, HEAL communities uh, that have done a fabulous job in terms of uh, public uh, messaging and health uh, education. Identification of populations at uh, risk. Uh, there is a growing literature trying to understand, for example, who is uh, at high risk of an opioid overdose, for example. And, and, and so th this is a growing field of research. The etiology of substance use disorder, I think there are still so many things we need to understand in terms of uh, uh, genetics, epigenetics, uh, stress, trauma, pain, uh, psychiatric comorbidities, as I mentioned, and very importantly, especially in this country, the social determinants of, uh, of health. 
Um, and then surely once some of these um, uh, factors have been identified, uh, what can we do in order to intervene on, uh, on them? Opportunities in diagnosis and treatment engagement, frankly, I think that this is all about uh, education. And education at three different levels, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the patients, uh, but also the families and the communities, and very importantly, the healthcare uh, providers. And I, I would like to insist on primary care physicians uh, here, because if you think about it, they are really in the front line of this issue. But the problem is that it can be incredibly intimidating uh, as a primary care physician to try to deal with a person suffering from a substance use if you have never done it before. And so we need to make sure that there is enough education uh, in order to help these physicians to actually help uh, patients they, they may believe are suffering from a substance use disorder. And from that perspective, you know, when you work in isolation, it's incredibly stressful. If you have the chance to work in teams or to have a coach who has been there before and can really take you by the hand and explain how you are going to treat uh, uh, this, uh, this patient, that's a completely different perspective and it can be transformational. What can we do in terms of treatment adherence and, and retention? A lot of ideas are there, but um, you know, it, 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 there is a lot of research now on predictors of uh, acute uh, outcomes, but very importantly, long-term uh, outcomes. And that is a little bit linked also to the, the, the populations or the subpopulations at uh, risks. Still today, we see a lot of studies that are focusing on, on the relatively short term, but we know that for some patients, uh, they will uh, have to remain in treatment over extensive periods of time. So we need more long-term follow-up uh, uh, studies. Uh, the introduction of long-acting uh, injectable formulations of some existing medications, I think, is a very good opportunity to uh, make sure that patients remain in treatment and are adherent to, uh, to treatment. Um, Non-opioid-based uh, medications uh, or mechanisms, that's quite fascinating. Again, uh, the NIH uh, has done a fabulous job in the context of the HEAL initiative to try to uh, incentivize research into non-opioid mechanisms for the treatment of pain. And um, of course, the same holds true for the treatment of opioid use disorder. There, are, there might be some patients who do not want to be maintained over extensive periods of time on an opioid-based medication. So what do we do to help them with a non-opioid mechanism? And then I really would like to insist on this. Um, when, when you are in, in the drug discovery and development business, of course, you are designing clinical trials in order to get regulatory approval. And, and this is done, of course, under um, very controlled clinical trials. Um, but you also have a list of inclusion and exclusion criteria of these patients. So, we need to make sure that uh, these uh, clinical uh, trials can actually translate to the real world. And so it is not enough just to run clinical trials for regulatory approval. After approval, there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of gathering real world evidence. And I, I listed there a few, a few examples that are relevant to uh, the recovery process. I think that uh, the role of psychosocial support uh, is quite critical as well. It is interesting that when you receive an approval for a medication for the treatment of substance use disorder, it always comes with psychosocial support. But the reality is that it can mean a lot of things in the real world, from basically nothing to some form of elaborate psychosocial support. So anything that can be done to standardize the quality of psychosocial support is going to be really critical. And then last but not least, I think there might be a role in digital therapeutics, the development of new applications that may really help uh, patients who are currently going through pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy to really remain uh, in treatment and uh, hopefully uh, gain recovery. 
And then the last one on, on recovery, I already mentioned that, uh, you know, yes, of course, abstinence is one goal, but that's not good enough. Recovery is a multifactorial approach, and we need to make sure that we start looking at other uh, outcomes as the one that I already mentioned before. There are new challenges, uh, but the good news, as I said before, when you have challenges, you have potential solutions, you have potential opportunities, and, and that's really a key message uh, here. So what are some of these new challenges? And there are many, many, but I had to put two uh, for, for today's presentation. What we have seen are two phenomena. Uh, new synthetic opioids, and that really started around 2014, um, and then unfortunately the COVID-19 pandemic. Now if you, if you start from there, we also started seeing some radical changes in drug market uh, dynamics. So significant reductions in purity of uh, the drugs available on the street and the likelihood of adulteration of well-known uh, 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 drugs. So for example, the situation is so bad these days that the users don't even really know what they are taking. They may think they took heroin, but in fact, heroin was probably laced with uh, synthetic opioids and that led to uh, the dramatic overdose situation that we are experimenting today. These changes in drug market dynamics also uh, translate into shifts in um, drug use uh, patterns. And, and we started seeing uh, an increase in street benzodiazepine uh, use. Uh, synthetic cannabinoids are becoming very concerning. Actually, the other day there was a report talking about new psychoactive substances worldwide, uh, but especially in the United States. But worldwide last year, there, there were more than uh, 1,200 new psychoactive substances, and it's probably underrated uh, because these are the ones that were picked by agencies such as the DEA, for example, and then some teams were able to characterize them. But you have, unfortunately, uh, a stream of new psychoactive substances available on the street. Quetiapine, which is a, an antipsychotic, is uh, also now appearing on the street, typically in combination with uh, heroin or stimulants, uh, really triggering more uh, anxiolytic and hypnotic uh, effects. We see a resurgence of uh, what we call the Z drugs, uh, typically uh, for the treatment of uh, insomnia. Uh, gabapentinoids, such as pregabalin and gabapentin, are, are getting there, and that's because a lot of physicians are trying to avoid prescribing uh, opioids. They are now moving towards non-opioid mechanisms, but unfortunately, uh, we see a resurgence of these uh, drugs on, on the street. And then over-the-counter medications like ephedrine, um, pseudoephedrine, uh, in, and even loperamide, um, that we, we typically call the, the poor man's methadone when used at very high doses. And then, of course, all that shifted to uh, polysubstance uh, use uh, patterns uh, that can be uh, concurrent or, or separate or a combination of both. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is that it makes treatment of substance use disorder even more challenging. So, challenges, opportunities, and uh, uh, lo looping back to Nora's presentation, the exciting part is that from a scientific perspective, I would say that for the last 35 to 40 years, I think we made a tremendous uh, a progress in understanding the neural circuits uh, that, that are uh, significantly involved uh, during substance use disorder. I would even say at different uh, parts of, uh, of uh, the disease. And it's more than just identifying brain regions, because historically we have been very good at doing that. But now, especially with neuroimaging techniques, we start understanding what we call functional connectivity. How do these brain regions interact with each other in response to chronic exposure to drugs of abuse? And then hopefully the future would be to try to demonstrate that medications for substance use disorder can actually stabilize patients because they stabilize some of the neurochemical imbalances in, in these neurocircuits. 
So just for the sake of the argument, and um, trust me, I will not take you through that little diagram for today's presentation, but just conceptually, uh, the exciting part is that because of this uh, uh, new understanding, we understand new biological systems. And when you have new biological systems, you have an opportunity to actually uh, discover new molecular entities. And from new molecular entities, there is a hope to develop new medications. So a few ideas there. Uh, first of all, I think we should uh, recognize, as Nora said, that we do have uh, good medications, especially for opioid use disorder. And so let's first look at what we can do there. Um, I mentioned new formulations, for example, especially long-acting injectable formulations of existing drugs. That's certainly a nice way forward for uh, guaranteeing treatment uh, retention and adherence. Um, we have been also less good, I believe, at doing combination uh, therapies. There are a few promising examples uh, there of combining existing therapies, although it is complicated because you are dealing with what we call drug-drug interactions. You need to make sure that when you give a combination of two drugs that there is not, no weird interactions between, between the two. I mentioned the exciting part, that is the new biological systems and the new chemical entities that you may translate into new uh, medications. I think uh, that uh, the, the promise also of discovering new biomarkers that might be predictors of a good clinical outcome is very exciting. And we are developing now uh, machine learning algorithms because we are dealing with an increasingly complex set of uh, data, and we need to find a way to really understand uh, all the data that, that we are generating. Clinical trials related to something I mentioned before. I think that historically and still today, we are very much focused on abstinence as primary endpoints in clinical trials. But again, um, we need to uh, uh, really think in terms of recovery. And if you think in terms of recovery, then it uh, shifts the way you are thinking about clinical endpoints and relevant uh, outcomes for these uh, patients. And then a last point, again, digital therapeutics. I think we are in need of developing new tools to really support uh, patients throughout their journey to uh, recovery. And uh, um, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Highrider. I'd like to bring to the podium now Dr. Tom McClellan. He's been a career researcher for 45 years as professor of psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania. He has published more than 650 research articles and completed more than 150 NIH research grants. He has received many Lifetime Achievement Awards from American and international medical societies. He served under President Obama as Deputy Director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and was also Senior Editor of the 2016 Surgeon General's Report, Facing Addiction. He serves on the board of Indivier and Shatterproof. He holds a BA from Colgate University, a PhD from Bryn Mawr College, and received postgraduate training at Oxford University. Dr. McClellan. Thank you very much. This is really an important issue. I see that my, the time allotted for my presentation has now elapsed, so I will be brief. Um, and let's, you, you heard excellent presentations about the promise of science, what we know, what we've learned very rapidly. And what I want to talk about is why that isn't happening. And specifically, I want to talk about why the system that we have that your kids are going to get treated in, your colleagues are going to get treated in, does not match the wonderful science that you've heard. Uh, I'll tell you the end before I tell you the, the middle. Bluntly, the United States addiction treatment system, though the most recent of the treatment systems, was founded on the available information at the time, but it is now very antiquated. It simply 
hasn't been able to deliver the kind of care that could happen. And the insurance, and the reason this is important, I would like to say particularly important to you, is that the insurance system has been influenced, in fact, created under the assumptions that predated our scientific understanding. And it continues to basically produce substandard care. So what are you talking about? How about if we look at some insurance benefits? Now, these are Medicaid benefits. And you'll see there a pretty standard set of um, elements. The percentages are the percentage of states and territories whose Medicaid uh, benefit supports that. And so you see these standard thing, detoxification, residential um, uh, outpatient. Uh, I'll note opioid medications, which is now the first line, most effective type of treatment for uh, opioid addiction. Only 65% of states and territories even support it, okay? And um, yeah, you can get urine testing along the way. Uh-huh. What's your point here, Tom? Well, a lot of us, particularly me, think that addiction is a chronic, severe addiction is a chronic illness. What would you have for a benefit for another chronic illness? Let's take diabetes, for example. Huh. So take a look at that for a minute. Now, I have advanced scientific training and years of research experience. So I can tell you with relative certainty, there's more stuff on this slide than there is on the last slide, okay? <laughs> but in fact, it's an antiquated slide. There, it, literally every week, more benefits are being added as new scientific developments pass FDA approval. But it's not just the quantity that's different here. It's the entire uh, quality and the concepts behind them. And I think that may be of interest to the public at large and to you as, as uh, uh, reporters. So why would you have a benefit that looked like that first one? What, what were the assumptions under which you would create it. Surely they didn't just pick them out of the air, and they didn't. Traditionally, addiction's been always, for centuries, thought of as a bad habit, something that derives from generally poor parenting or poor character, um, and in, or, or um, it is merely a product of withdrawal and tolerance. So if you're gonna have a treatment benefit, the thing you ought to do is first of all, get the toxins out of the system, detox. That's why everybody, uh, every insurance benefit supports that. And then do all you can with therapy to strengthen character and resolve and resilience to, to prevent relapse. Um, get patients to complete treatment. That's been the marker of success if they complete the program, okay? and. Um, if you're going to do evaluation at all, you do it at the end of treatment to see if treatment has worked. Okay, thank, thank you for sharing, Tom. What, so what's that have to do? Um, notice that those benefit elements were designed for the most severely affected individuals. Um, indeed, insurance procedures such as pre-certification assure that only those who meet criteria for severe addiction get into treatment, okay? Um, notice, too, that the benefits are designed for a specialty care system, the 16 to 18,000 treatment programs in the United States. There's a reason for that, because you don't, with very few exceptions, you don't get any kind of addiction treatment in your primary care setting. It's segregated, okay? Um, no primary care benefits there. Um, most of these benefits are in a packaged form. In other words, you support the program, just like if you were going on a vacation, you get a packaged set of things. I yeah, what's your point? You can't get individualized care in a package, okay? Um, 
very few care options, and it's only been recently that there's been efforts on the part of insurance to try to in, um, engage, retain patients in treatment. So how's that all worked? Um, well, um, as Nora said, as everybody said, this focus on addiction has come with a price. There's not much available for the far larger proportion of people who have emerging substance misuse are at danger of developing. They, you just, we don't have a benefit for that. Um, two, it, it, do I have to tell you for the 55th time there's stigma and with that very low penetration? If patients enter at all, they don't enter early when their condition is, is, is uh, highly treatable. They enter at the end uh, after all other options are fulfilled. And as uh, Christian said, the, the rule, not the exception, is they enter with multiple problems, both physical medicine and uh, mental health problems. And with that comes poor adherence, uh, modal, in outpatient drug abuse treatment, the modal duration of treatment is one visit, and high relapse rates. So, um, so put differently, addiction treatment and its uh, insurance benefit may not fit the science, it may not be attractive to the target population. If they come, they may not stay. If they stay, they may likely relapse, but at least it's expensive. Okay, <laughs> S compared to what? Well, again, take a look at those diabetes benefits. Now, it's not just the number. Look at the nature of what's there. It looks to me like who, the creators of this insurance benefit are trying very hard to provide options for patients, not only to engage them, but in case a certain option doesn't work, they have a different thing so they can uh, treat them. It, look at the last one. If you don't speak the language, you can get, as part of an insurance benefit of diabetes, you can get language interpretation skills. I, did you see that in the uh, addiction benefit? I, I didn't see that, okay. Um, many medications, uh, smoking cessation, and of course, what you're, you're it's all through the papers, uh, weight reduction therapies, and that's smart. And, and the, the, the reason this is important is this benefit is designed for the full population of potentially and actually affected individuals. There's a benefit there for people who, who by ver dent of their um, uh, genetics or family background and their early behaviors show evidence that they're on their way to getting diabetes. So you can get treated for pre-diabetes here. Um, and that's just smart. Most are primary care oriented and you know why? Because there ain't no primary care doctors who don't know how to treat diabetes. You can't get out of medical school unless you, you Less than 50% of medical schools in this country have a course in addiction. Um, notice that they are visit benefits. Again, the reason that's important is that can lead to personalized care. There's a mix and a match of things. Notice finally um, that not only are there a variety of care options, but you might have noticed there's evaluation built in. And it's a clinical service. It's not an add-on. Uh, when they wrap that cuff, blood pressure cuff around, that's an evaluation. When they do hemoglobin A1C tests, that's an evaluation. And the reason they do that is so they can find out if the care delivered to that point is working. If it is, let's keep it up. If it's not working, you don't throw the patient out of diabetes care. No, that would be malpractice. You change the care. And you can do that because you can. Um, you have all kinds of other options available to you. So I've gone through that very quickly. And I want to conclude with something that um, I'll, I'll disagree with several of my colleagues. Mo several of my colleagues have said uh, 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 recovery is possible. Uh -uh. This is one of the opening statements in the 2016 um, uh, Surgeon General's report. Recovery now is an expectable outcome of evidence-based 
continuing care. That's a bold statement, but I think the evidence supports it. Now, here's the bad news. The bad news is if your kids go to care, they're not going to get it. They're going to get antiquated care from an antiquated, well-intentioned, earnest, hardworking set of people who are simply handcuffed by a, a, an insurance benefit and a set of assumptions that don't allow for the kind of care that both Christian and, and Nora have been talking about. That result can happen. We can have evidence-based, comprehensive, effective care, but it's going to take a reorientation to science-based understanding by the public. Enter the press. It's going to take true insurance parity. And one of the things the addiction field doesn't have that the diabetes field does have, diabetes has the American Diabetes Association. It's an advocacy organization that speaks on behalf of patients and their families, and they lobby to get the most current stuff. We ain't got that. Best we have is, is uh, and it's damn good, is shatterproof. Um, and we continue to have a segregated addiction treatment system and an addiction treatments benefit that perpetuates something that is simply not sustainable. So I hope that's been of value to you, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. So recovery is expected. I love that. And our next guest actually is living proof of that. So our final speaker is Alexandra Sozes. She's a certified nursing assistant who specializes in recovery and aftercare for patients. She's also pursuing her doctorate in healing through, I, I'm not going to say this right, but Ayurveda. 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 She's going to tell us all about that. Um, and her dream is to open her own line of recovery centers. Uh, she's been in recovery for five years, and she's a Shatterproof Ambassador. So I am so thrilled to invite her to share her story. She is our Magic Johnson today. <laughs> Come on up. Hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, it is one of my biggest blessings and something I've been manifesting for five years. So um, it's really an honor. Um, so I am here to tell you um, that recovery is possible. Um, you know, the word impossible is one of my favorites because it literally says I'm possible. Um, and I'm so glad that I held on to hope because it was incredibly dark. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of that. But again, thank you guys for uh, listening to me. So um, I guess I'm, you know, being an addict, I've, I've been an addict since I was a child. Um, I had to be the best at everything. I played every seasonal sport. Um, I was never OK with one of anything. Um, and uh, growing up, you know, I had, you know, I wasn't, just this, you know, statistically speaking, you know, doomed child. Um, I was great. I, I excelled in school. Um, you know, my brother and sister were, you know, we were all just fortunate to have great parents and supportive, and uh, everything went really well. Um, but when you're really good at things um, at a young age, everyone loves you, and uh, you don't have to learn how to love yourself. And I would say that probably was where I let my addiction change as I became an adult. Um, I believe that that is one of the biggest fundamentals in recovery, um, being able to you know, create boundaries and have healthy living. Um, and when you're, you're fast and you know, you're young and you're, you're inspired um, and maybe a little bit manic, depressive, um, you just kind of run. So at 30 years old, I lost a baby. Um, I went to the hospital uh, two occasions, and they had sent me home telling me that I wasn't pregnant, but I had had a miscarriage before, and I was convinced that I had something. Um, there was something in there. Um, 
Father's Day um, of all days, I was rushed to the ER because it, I had a baby that had burst in my fallopian tube. Um, I ended up having an emergency C-section that led to the removal of a four-month-old baby and my, one of my fallopian tubes. Um, then they told me that I would never have children and that, um, you know, they were sorry. They had made a mistake. Um, I was then given seven months, well, six and a half months, seven of Dilaudid and morphine, um, which, you know, growing up, I had recreationally played with pretty much almost every drug. Um, I, you know, never had any issues. With alcohol, I did. Um, with the mania, it was just natural to drink a little too much at times. Um, but with opiates, it was different. Um, with opiates, uh, just to even think about it right now, I, I have PTSD so bad it feels like I can't breathe um, because it's just not who I am. Um, my heart never changed, thank God, throughout everything I've been through. But, you know, when my journey down opiates began, it was, it was fast. It was, um, you know, it was first me realizing that I was addicted to something because I would get the flu. This is when flu B came out. So I thought it was just flu B. I wasn't sure. Um, but it was always when I didn't have my pills. Um, then shortly after, you know, wrong, wrong people, wrong places, wrong times, wrong paths, um, and wrong decisions led me to, you know, full-blown heroin use. Um, that also led to other narcotics, and it just got bad. I lost everything um, that I loved. Nobody believed in me anymore. Um, I didn't believe in me anymore. Um, I was homeless. I, I lived in some of the scariest places you can imagine in the city um, because I was too ashamed to be around people that knew me. Um, so I hid. Um, I have to... Thank God for being a member of the Chub Club now, because back then I was probably 114 pounds, um, and it was hard. There were days um, that I don't, I don't think, I don't think I ever cared really for myself and my addiction. But the beautiful thing is that I still cared for others, and um, my ability to help others has never, it's never been changed. It's, it's always been steady. And I've always been used. And in my story, I have to say God, um, because he's who saved me. There were scientists and people like you all that worked into, you know, helping, you know, change the pace of medication and the kind of, you know, where I lived, it was so scary. The ambulance wouldn't come to get you. It would be people that volunteered. So I thank God for empathy, because I wouldn't have made it here without that. Um, and fast forward. Um, I found myself into treatment, um, not in our area because we have very little um, Medicaid-based treatment centers for, for addicts who do not have the, f the funds. I went in Delaware and um, started my recovery journey with my family who was living out there, half of them. I ended up finding, you know, the love of my life and, uh, and I stayed out there a couple years. Um, and, you know, one bad decision um, with my fiancé led to, you know, a relapse that six months later ended his life. Um, and then a month later I lost my brother, um, who was not an addict, but, you know, was in the program for AA and was in a sober house. And one bad decision for both of them, um, you know, cost them both their lives because fentanyl is now, you know, a war um, for you know, addicts for, for the unhealed. Um, and that's what I truly believe, um, you know, that on my path through my sobriety, I learned how to love myself um, and being equipped with, with that knowledge and to be able to create healthy boundaries. I've been able to stay clean and abstinent off of drugs, and I'm just so grateful for that. Um, but now, you know, my purpose has changed in life. Now um, it turns out that I was the medicine, and that my pain is my cure, and um, and now I live by purpose and by you know design, and and I'm I'm always you know in service of helping another. I always say help one, save two, um, because it's the only way that I stay accountable. It's the only way that I I 
I can make happiness. My, you know, I've been through a lot, and it, and it hurts. Um, it's hard not to cry up here. It's hard not to cry when I hear the statistics and know that you know one of those overdoses was me, maybe three or four of them. Um, and uh, in that year of 2018, you know what I mean, or 2017 or 16, and and um, and nobody believed in me, and um, and I'm really glad that I held on. Um, somebody once told me that hope, the acronym was hold on, pain ends, and I'm here to say that it does, and that I didn't see it then though. I didn't see or feel the happiness when I was on drugs. I could not feel the same. I was distant and disconnected and you know although like I said my heart was still in alignment of my life's purpose um, I couldn't feel it for myself um, because it took that away and um, and I really look forward to more advancements and everything else and you know and now as long as well as you know being a nurse which I was before I started um, using now you know I go to school for Ayurveda I go to Mahari Maharishi International University where I'm in a conscious uh, education program to you know learn people to heal you know themselves from within and for me it's actually like the best aftercare right now because I don't fit in the AA or NA block anymore and and we need a recovery and an aftercare that 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 is for all forms of recovery because my recovery path is very different than than yours and you don't have to be a drug addict or an alcoholic to have a recovery path you just have to know immeasurable pain um, and know that there's a solution and that's where we come in um, you just have to have a little empathy you, you know um, my job is to tug at your heartstrings and and to change your mind um, because before I lost that baby I was one, I was one of them. I didn't, I stayed away from my friends that went that route. I, I tried to help it. If they couldn't stop, I didn't understand why, but, but out of fear, I retreated and, um, you know, and I helped them now and I've helped them since, but that forgiveness is hard um, because you never know um, until it happens to you. And if there's anything I can tell you is that my whole survival and existence is, is just a story of hope. Um, and that's what I'm here to spread. So that's the only way I feel like recovery can change, that we can reduce the stigma. I mean, even in being in recovery, I have fellows that, you know, it's sinners judging sinners sinning differently. And and it's so hard to make a way when you can't even do it within your own, you know, fellowship. So, you know, I really thank you guys for this opportunity. Um, I've been manifesting this since I got sober and they passed and I knew that my purpose was to save the next one from feeling the pain that I felt. Um, so just to be in alignment and to be here is just a dream come true. Um, I really appreciate all of you. And uh, my name is Alexandra, and I'm shatterproof. <laughs> <laughs>
in and of itself for the outcomes of people suffering it, but as a cultural shift, it actually is one of the main drivers. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll, I'll add. Um, and I'm, I would put forth a note of caution. It's not coincidence that addiction has so much stigma. If you live with an actively addicted person, they are not the kind of people you want to be around. They uh, do not have full control of their better selves, as, as, um, as was said. And so I, I'm, I'm not sure you're ever going to get rid of the stigma of active addiction. But what bothers me the most is what we're really talking about. This, the stigma continues to people who are in active recovery. And, they, and the reason, part of the reason that the stigma continues is because they're invisible. You don't see the successes. And I, I would just add um, education, education, education. Yeah. Um, you know, at, at different levels. Education of patients who sometimes do not even really recognize the gravity of their uh, condition. Uh, education of communities, educations of families, and very importantly, educations of uh, healthcare providers. Uh, there are still very few, especially primary care physicians, who know how to deal with uh, the disease and anything we can do to support them. As I said during the brief presentation, it's a daunting task. The first time you are faced with a patient suffering from substance use disorder and you have no clue what to do. Mm -hmm. And you are alone and you have no support. So anything we can do to support uh, patients, families, communities, and uh, especially primary care physicians is going Fair to be enough. critical. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, I feel like without empathy, um, without being able to put yourself in that position, I mean, I would challenge someone, you know, to then think about what it would be like to be an addict, you know, put away your cell phone for one or two days, um, hide it from yourself. Every time you think about it, every time you think of anything about it, it's like, you know, it's what being an addict is like. Um, and, you know, just to try to humanize yourself, people really need to start learning how to humanize. And it's not just with addiction, it's just in the state of the world. And, our nation in general with what everything we've been through the last few years. Um, and it's, you know, you never know what somebody next to you is going through. So it's just important to be kind um, and to be open to the unknown because fear can keep you out of a lot of amazing things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You can't see the recovery. I think that was a really powerful statement. Or we're not seeing it. And mm -hmm. maybe that's something that we really have to start to change. Um, you know, I, wanna, I have actually a question for somebody who's in the, the audience, who's Courtney McKeon, who I mentioned earlier today, who uh, leads our national stigma initiative at Shatterproof. Um, we created a national plan to address addiction stigma. And you know, I would love for you to describe some of the findings of the report from our, our index, but also some of the ways that the media and others kind of be addressing stigma. Yeah, thank you, Kirsten. Um, so as Kirsten mentioned, we released the Shatterproof Addiction Stigma Index in 2021, and that was a way for us to set a baseline for what stigma looked like um, in the country, and then hold ourselves accountable to progress against it. How can we use evidence-based solutions to reduce the stigma of addiction of the general public holds? In that um, survey that came out in 2021, we saw that over half of people did not want someone who had a substance use disorder to marry into their family, and they didn't want them to be their close personal friend, right? And then that is further internalized by someone who has a substance use disorder. So people who identified as having an opiate use disorder, about 46%, said they felt ashamed of themselves. Um, and that persists even when people are in recovery. Um, so then as we look at, you know, medication for opioid use disorder, while 90% of respondents felt like treatment works, about half of them endorsed the harmful belief that medication for opioid use disorder is actually just substituting one drug for another. Also, um, when we think about medication for opioid use disorder, while they support it, as soon as you ask them, would you put a clinic with medication for opioid use disorder in your neighborhood, 
about 50% said, absolutely not. I would not do that. And we call that, you know, the, the NIMBYism or not in my backyard. Mm -hmm. So talking about how substance use disorder, it can impact anyone and it does not discriminate. So what can the media do? Um, what are some tangible things, right? We can use person-first language. There's evidence and research that shows that using person-first language, like a person with a substance use disorder, um, can really help health outcomes. And um, Shatterproof put, put out a language guide in 2020 that you can find on the Shatterproof website, which can help you think about other ways to um, talk about addiction and people who have substance use disorder. Also, when we're talking about imagery, thinking about using person-first imagery. Um, sharing facts about the treatability of substance use disorder and education, right? Educate, educate, educate. Um, let's reverse the common misconception that medication for opioid use disorder, the first line of, of um, treatment, the gold standard, it is effective. It is not substituting one drug for another and it can be used um, for long-term recovery, not just for detoxification. Highlight the diversity of people with lived experiences. Center the people who have lived experience at the, in the story, right? Um, demonstrate that substance use disorder can affect anyone. And then as Kirsten mentioned earlier, point people to resources. If you are highlighting a story around addiction, point people to resources so they know where to go if they think that them or their loved one might be navigating substance use disorder or might be you know, have, um, experiencing problematic use. Give them resources and um, places where they can seek out treatment. Thank you. Were there any questions from the uh, panel online? Oh, we have any questions in the room. Perfect. Great. Oh, I have a question. <coughs> Just a couple comments. Well, first off, you know, thank you, Shatterproof, and thank you, panel. Um, my name is Duke Burris. I'm from Fairfax, Virginia. And next Friday, I'll be recognizing uh, the loss of my son to fentanyl. It's his third year. And I have some real life experience that I could just go on and go on. But I'll try to um, you know, put it in a capsule. Um, First off, you know, and Tom, to your point, our recovery community is so fragmented. It's so broken. And I can tell you from personal experience, stigma, one of the biggest groups of professionals that have stigma is the health care industry. Um, my daughter uh, had an overdose. And I get this text message from a friend. I go to the hospital at 4 AM. There she is. As soon as she wakes up, you know. Anyway, about an hour later, bye, see ya. Uh, by the way, that was closed. I wouldn't do that again. Now, back to your diabetes slide. If it had been me, if I had been brought in in an ambulance, they would have kept me for several days. They would have given me, you know, an outpatient strategy. I, it would have just gone on and on and on. Mm -hmm. But with my daughter, boot, good luck. And, it's, and you're seeing it in reality, and you're like, crap. Um, excuse my language. Um, and, and the stigma, not long after my son passed, I'm sitting there in a chair you know, with my son. This person of my age comes walking up behind me, and then you know, she sees the plaque, and she offers her condolences. And she asks, how did he pass? I went an overdose. I don't hide it. Yeah. She stiffened up and stormed off like she had been smacked. And so back to, on a, back to you, Tom. Our um, institutions to support recovery are broken. They are absolutely broken. And the reason they're broken is they were designed 50 years ago, a long time ago. And so much has changed. Drugs have changed. It's just like, it's just exponentially just pew, and our systems have not. My son tried calling the county um, community service board where we're supposed to get help. Oh, we can see you in eight weeks. I call, see you in eight weeks. Really? So when there's a need, for example, like when a loved one, and you're told, well, they could be here six days. And so you're looking, looking, looking for a place to go. Next thing you know, by the way, this afternoon, you need to pick them up. You know, like, ah. and, and so you're trying to find 
that detox facility. It's word of mouth. And to be honest, I didn't even know about Shatterproof until after my son died. And it's like, so how did you pull? And, and you know, I challenge the industry. We need a national resource. And not only that, but quality standards. You know, what's the quality? Because you're go it's word of mouth. When you're sending someone here, the quality could be good, it could be bad, it's expensive, you don't care. You're just going for help. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's when we use our voices, we make the change, right? Absolutely. Is there any other questions? I, I just to follow up, I guess, with uh, Dr. McLellan about uh, the what appears to be uh, uh, a failure or a lack of sufficient uh, insurance coverage uh, for those who may need treatment and uh, re for recovery. And I was just wondering, is there any place to find out uh, which insurers, I don't know, United Healthcare or Medicare, Medicaid, which of those uh, need improvement? So uh, the public perhaps could apply some pressure to have them cover uh, this important area that they may not be covering. You hit it on the nose. It, that's what it's going to take. Um, Fifteen years ago, Medicaid was a tiny fraction of the in, coverage for addiction treatment. Most addiction treatment was uh, handled by state block grants, okay? A whole different system than the rest of medicine, quite purposely. It was segregated. But with the passing of the Affordable Care Act, now um, Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid are, are over 75% of all insurance. Now, it may be managed by your Uniteds or your uh, Aetnas or Kaiser, but those are Medicaid and Medicare benefits. Now, I made a statement, I'm going to repeat it, that one of the big differences that I see between almost every other uh, illness or population of people with a chronic illness is there is a national association of diabetes families, national association of mental illness, et cetera. They are advocating for the benefits that science determines. They they, they put pressure on the um, legislators to make sure those benefits are written in. We ain't got that. The best we have is, is shatterproof, and I'm not denigrating that. We don't, there's so much stigma that families haven't gotten together and said, I demand the kind of care that Nora and, and, and Christian can make available. Though they are starting to grow, I mean, I was thinking of Addiction Policy Forum that has brought up families, yep. and I think it has been a breakthrough. Agreed. But I think that that is the message, that we need to actually mm -hmm. bring them together as opposed to isolated groups, because it can make a big difference. Question coming from online. Um, to Dr. Volkov, um, what are the most important federal prevention stories the media should cover today? They are, um, there are several uh, federal, I mean, preventions uh, for which there is evidence that they have benefit in terms of preventing the person from taking drug, but they actually, there are stories that are so successful that they actually show that they even improve the outcomes on the next generation. And many of those actually, again, you have the universal ones that are interventions that you can do very broadly, and then you have the tailored ones that you can do, for example, or individuals that have an underlying psychiatric disorder that makes them more vulnerable. For the universal ones, what is really dramatic is to provide socioeconomic support to families that are in very distressed situations. And in fact, there is a recent paper that was just published that compared different states in the United States that was evaluating the outcomes of children that were born in low-income families depending on the level of economic parenthood support for low-income families that those states show. And it showed how it actually significantly blunted the negative effects of being brought up in a low-income household 
as it relates to cognitive performance, as it relates to actually even brain measures of brain development, neurodevelopment at that age. And there are several papers that have come across. So improving uh, the social support system for families that are in need is an extremely consequential intervention. And for those, identification of children that are at higher risk, right. tailoring that. So the whole notion of screening, screening for an underlying uh, psychiatric disorder, whether it's an anxiety, as I mentioned, depression, or inability to pay attention, those kids, if they are not properly intervened for those, for those emerging symptoms, are going to try to automedicate. Mm -hmm. So the data is very strong and powerful. And there's also data, for example, that is in between universal and tailored, where you can identify kids that are better at self-regulation. So if I want something and I said, okay, I'm not going to take it because it's not a good idea, how good I am at doing that. And that is the skill that predicts uh, future substance use and en engagement on risky behavior. And it's a skill that if you intervene, you can strengthen the ability of a child to actually improve on their self-regulation. So there's a multiplicity of interventions. It's not that we don't have them. It's that they, just like we were discussing it in terms of the treatment or the quality of the treatment that is very important, that is not sufficiently supported, the same thing happens with prevention interventions. They are not supported for the most part. If I could just add one thing to what Nora, Nora actually said this earlier, but it bears repeating. If you drive down the road and you, you'll see a sign for hospital hospital emergency room. You can drive in there and get treatment. Where's the sign for prevention? There, there isn't one. There isn't a workforce. There isn't a delivery system that does the kind of things Nora is, is talking about. There are many research <coughs> grants, and they are extremely impressive in what they can do, but we don't have an organized system for prevention. Thank you, um, Dr. Volkow. This question came in from Allison Knopf, um, editor for the Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Weekly. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions at the moment, but if you have any further questions, we can answer them online. Yes. Oh, sorry, we can, we can afford one more. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Malcolm Spicer. I write about the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, primarily, uh, my uh, relevance here is you know, I've written a lot about naloxone. Uh, Dr. Volkov, you have me at hello once again. So uh, th 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 it's always a pleasure to hear you uh, speak. Uh, one of the first things you said, though, and it touches on your answer to the last question, was about uh, what makes a person go against everything for their well-being and continue that behavior. And of course, that also harms the well-being of people close to them. Is, are you, is the research uh, going to find an answer there, or is there research actually asking that question? Oh, the, the research has already answered that question. I mean, and, and in terms of neuroscience, the term that is expressed to is sensitization. So in, if I use a metaphor, for example, if I touch a stove that is very hot, automatically I remove my hand. And it's very difficult for you to actually interfere with that. Even if I tell you, you will immediately remove your hand. And so that, that element, there, why do you do that? Because there is actually, um, your brain is hardwired to actually react that way over other alternative behaviors. When you become addicted to a drug, you get sensitized and your brain learns that reaction. It's almost like an automatic instinctual response. So you generated an artificial intellectual, artificial uh, response of desire that is basically then takes over. Say, for example, you are extremely hungry. The priority of your brain, if you put food there, even if it's, say, you're very hungry, and I tell you this food is contaminated, and you know cognitively you shouldn't eat that food because if you eat it, you're going to get sick, you nonetheless are unable to stop it. So it is, the addiction has led the brain to feel that it's in a state of a, state of a deprivation that if you don't address it, you're not going to survive. So, and there are certain states, if I don't have any air, I'll do anything to, to, to breathe over anything else. So when you're addicted, it just puts you into that mental state that it's uh, such a, a state of urgency. So we do know 
And obviously, what there is a lot of interest, and we spoke, I mean, in terms of very exciting science in, in potential about how to do therapeutics to actually reverse some of those changes. And I think that if I went to say, because this was transformative in my brain, I always say, yes, addiction is a chronic disease, and it is a chronic disease, and it and needs to long-term treatment. But the science had, has advanced so much at this point that I think for the first time, we can foresee that we may be able to cure addiction. And, and, I, and again, in the past, I would say that's magical thinking. That's not going to happen. But the advances in science are providing uh, information that can put a path towards how to achieve a cure for addiction, which would be, of course, extraordinary. But it is uh, feasible. I mean, it is potentially theoretically feasible. All right. Well. I want to thank everybody for coming today. We're at time, but as you know, we could talk about this for hours. We have people who are willing to talk about this for future interviews, for getting the right information. Please visit shatterproof.org slash media resources. All of the things we talked about today, the resources, the language guide, the materials that you need, they're all there. Again, that's shatterproof.org slash media resources. And um, we appreciate you, and we appreciate uh, the articles that we plan to see uh, that were going to give us hope and recovery and are going to help save lives. Thank you.